हेलो फ्रेंड्स नमस्ते 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 असीफ भाई नमस्ते गौरव नमस्ते नमस्ते शाबीर लवली आप फ्रेंड्स आर आल्सो हियर इट्स बीन अ लॉन्ग टाइम वी वी स्टॉप डूइंग आवर वेबिनार्स इन द मिडल आई वाज आउट वी गॉट पीपल हियर ऑलरेडी आरएफ इज हियर हरप्रीत रोहन महेंद्र जी मनोजना अमित गगन वेलकम वेलकम फ्रेंड्स सो गुड टू सी ऑल ऑफ यू दिस टाइम इज बीन अ लॉन्ग गैप आई वाज अवे टू केरला फॉर सिक्स मंथ्स टू री इंस्टेट हटे योगा लर्न अबेड अबाउट आयुर्वेदा एंड यू नो टू बी मोर मेडिटेटिव which is why we stopped all the webinars in the middle but now we back and slowly we are getting back into action with our webinars to bring information across to you and also to tell you why we doing what we doing it's it's very interesting to see that many old people who been attending our webinars are back here and there's some new people as well so i won't take much time i'll get started uh well my introduction a lot of you already know me i'm mohit agarwal i'm an eco tourism specialist um the founder of asian adventures uh, we've completed 28 years in in nature centric tourism why we are doing uh, this webinar on pangolins let me briefly tell you about 17 18 years ago we started a large in gir which is right adjacent to um the forest boundary called gir birding lodge so it was difficult for people to comprehend why a birding lodge you know what what's got to do with birds and that's the time when you know things in gujarat were not very stable uh, you know for tourism and we decided it was a good time to get started Oh, by the way, am I audible clearly? Can can you all type yes if I am audible properly? Okay, great. Thank you. So, so we started this lodge in Gir because we wanted to bring about the culture of bird tourism. We wanted to start bird watching tourism. It was already being done by a few people, but we wanted people to appreciate. the cause of birds and like dr salim ali said that if lions weren't there then what better park can there be for birds so so we decided that gir was the best place for us to start bird tourism so we started this gir birding lodge 17 18 years ago now what happened was um, after i finished 6 months in kerala which was in december i decided to spend 2 months in gir at this lodge while i was there i you know i started to uh, revamp some systems enjoy park safaris you know i started to take photos um and my connect with natural history is is always been very deep so i decided <clears throat> that why you know how to how to reshape gir birden lodge as an eco centric nature centric lodge i realized that there was a big gap uh which has happened in the last 17 years um between urbanization and the jungle culture of gir what has happened is that people have started to construct farm houses big hotels have come up there are many many um fields which have been occupied for for agriculture nothing wrong of but that but it is that there was less and less space for wildlife now and i realized that the new generation may not even know especially the tourists or the hoteliers or people or in our trade may not even know what a pangolin looks like and why pangolin because pangolin is a highly highly endangered animal right now 
in due course, Gaurav, Haseeb, and Shabez will talk about uh, pangolin. And because it's highly endangered and it's it's a safe gear is a safe haven for pangolins. I decided that we must take up the cause of pangolin because it's just getting so rare. Uh, as it is, it's elusive. People don't get to see it. And then it's highly endangered. So we must do something where it's better protected. Yeah. So now Chavez is here, Gaurav is here, Hasib is here. They're all going to talk to you about different aspects of pangolin. Chavez is from Borneo. He's here today to give us an international perspective of pangolins. Gaurav is here from Pune. He's a biologist. He's going to talk to you about this, uh, the status of uh, pangolins. Then there is Haseeb Sheikh, the storehouse of knowledge. He's going to talk to you about different uh, historical aspects of pangolins. And then at the end, I'm going to talk to you about what we are going to do for pangolins at Gear Birding Lodge. So over to you, Shabes. You go first, and rest of us can mute ourselves. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Bahut uh, bahut shukriya uh, Asian Adventures, Mr. Mohit, and the whole team for uh, inviting me over. Uh, I actually live in a national park, and I just got out of the park just for this webinar. So please excuse me, and I sincerely apologize for my background setting and everything. So uh, I will need your assistance to help me with my slides. Uh, whoever is uh, handling my slide. Is it Priya? Yeah, okay. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, I don't see my slides yet, but uh, let me do my introduction. So uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Chavez Chima. I am a conservationist who is based on the island of Borneo, which is in Malaysia. And it's an island which is which, which is comprises of Malaysia, Indonesia, and Brunei. I'm a founder of an organization, it's called One Stop Borneo Wildlife, and we do the four E's, which is education, enforcement, uh, enrichment of ecosystems and economy. So we develop long-term tourism programs for wildlife. To, so our programs are sustainable. We can use the profits to sustain our pro projects. We have a wildlife rescue service on pangolins. Um, uh, we, 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 we do replanting to reconnect fragmented forest reserves by planting wildlife favorite food. We have a very comprehensive education program to, uh, to educate the public and enforcement. We catch poachers by placing camera traps on top of trees. Now, let me tell you about pangolins. So there are eight species of pangolins, four in Africa and four in Asia. The pangolin you have in India is called the Indian pangolin. And uh, it's also found in, I think, in Pakistan as well. I'm not sure if it's found in Bangladesh or in Afghanistan. Uh, the pangolin species which I have in my area is called the Sunda pangolin. Okay. All of them kind of look alike and similar. Okay, of course, the Indian pangolin, I believe the scale is really big, and the black bellied pangolin is totally different. So, the Sunda pangolin, I've been working on the Sunda pangolin for the last 10 years. I have a wildlife rescue service on them. So, let me tell you more about it. The pictures on screen are taken by myself. The Sunda pangolin is a nocturnal animal, meaning to say it is only active at night. Okay, so it only uh, yeah, during the daytime, we have seen it sleeping in tree holes, tree burrows, in palm oil plantations, at the at the husk on top of the tree, or we have we have actually even interviewed loggers, uh, you know, timber loggers who have cut down the trees, and they say the pangolin was sleeping at the top, and you know they had the pangolin in their hand. Um, so this is uh, from their uh, sleeping habits. Uh, pangolins are uh, we have we have recorded them everywhere. We have recorded them in cities, walking around towns at night. We have recorded them in the jungle, in, in logged roads, on highways. Pangolins are excellent climbers, as you can see the pictures. I'm sorry for the background noise, everybody. Okay, pangolins are excellent climbers. Okay, they're excellent climbers and they're excellent swimmers. A lot of people do not know pangolins can actually swim. And I actually have another video I've seen of pangolins swimming in the open sea. So they're amazing swimmers. Now, first of all, 
I'm talking about the ecology aspect. Let me tell you a little bit. You see, pangolins are very important in the ecosystem. Now, you might be wondering why. First of all, you have to understand what do pangolins eat? They eat ants and termites, okay? Uh, and they can eat up to 100,000 ants a night. So now, to understand how important they are in the ecosystem, you have to understand why are ants important in the ecosystem? Ants are important in the ecosystem because they are soil engineers. They keep the pH level of the soil neutral, okay? And they eat other insects or get eaten by other animals. So can you imagine if pangolins went extinct, there'll be a lot of ants, hypothetically speaking, right? So that means they will, there might be a disruption in the pH level of the soil. Maybe the soil could become a bit more acidic or alkaline, and this could affect the whole ecosystem. Maybe certain plant species might die, which other animals rely on, or if, let's say if, if, if it becomes too acidic, and the ungulates or deers, the pigs, which eat the plants, they, you know, which are eaten by other predators, you know, they might die off. This is a potential scenario. Ants eat so many other insects. Now, they, in the short run, this sounds amazing, right? Lots of food. But again, every animal insect in the ecosystem has a role to play. So too many insects being, di uh, be being eaten and only ants, it could affect the whole ecosystem. So ants are very important. We must, uh, sorry, pangolins are very important. We must protect them for this very reason. Uh, uh, before, uh, another thing I would like to share, which is not part of my ecological uh, uh, segment, is that uh, pangolin poaching, especially during the pandemic, has become even more popular on social media. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Yes, people are selling pangolins and other animals in WhatsApp groups and, pang you know, and so on. Because you know, due to lockdowns, people go, don't go to towns or go into the market. So they sell them online. Like these are some screenshots. And how did they catch them in the jungle? They put these big nets, like a trawling fishing, you know, like a like a trawler fisher who puts trawling nets along the for a sea floor. They put kilometers of nets along the forest floor to catch pangolins. Now, so pangolins are in deep trouble. However, I believe education is key. A lot of people do not know pangolins are endangered or why they're so important. We have done 184 workshops in schools and we have done 180 rescues, almost 100 pangolins. Because every time we did a workshop, the kid would call us or the parents would call us and say, hey, my child came to our, your workshop. Uh, we have a pangolin now. We don't want to sell it. We don't want to eat it. We don't want to kill it. Here you go. So I believe education is key. So that's the short segment I wanted to share on ecology of pangolins, that they're, uh, uh, they're nocturnal. They're excellent climbers. They're excellent swimmers. They're important in the ecosystem because they control the ant population and ants, you know, control the pH level of the soil and they eat other insects. So you can just imagine if the pangolins went extinct. The threats faced by the pangolins now are of course illegal trade and now social media is a big problem. So how can you help? If you see animals being sold online, please report to Facebook, to Instagram. Hopefully they'll take it down and that's the best you can do. And I can tell you, it does work. Education is key, rescues can happen. You all can make a difference. Uh, that's all I wanted to share about pangolins and their ecology and some of the threats from Borneo at least. But I believe this is all over Africa and maybe even India. Uh, that, that, that's all from myself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chavez. That was really, really useful. And a quick session to give them a perspective of what is happening in, in your part of the world with pangolins. It's, it's important to, to know what's happening across the world with pangolins and why pangolins are important. Like you said, that the ant population will go up really high and it can change the ecology of the area or it, it can create any sort of problems with our crops and things like that. So, so wonderful, wonderful. And thank you for coming. Um, your, because your phone is in uh, portrait mode, it appears you're lying down. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay. No, no, I'm not lying down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so that's fine. And now um, the, uh, we, we want to um, ask Gaurav to tell us about the status of Indian pangolin um, 
you know in india or in gear whatever he's got to present could i could i ask one question before gaurav begins yes Shavis? yes 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 Shavis, this is our cb here and my question is that when you shared your pictures of your borneo part uh, pangolin saram i thought they were a bit smaller in size a bit smaller shade about let's say 10 to 15 percent <clears throat> smaller than the indian pangolin and also the color was on the darker side is am i right on that count you're very right pangolins are darker here and they're smaller the biggest pangolin we have ever found is 16 kilograms however there have been records of up to 20 kilograms but the scales are smaller the animal is smaller i've seen the indian pangolin captivity it is smaller and the sunda pangolin is darker right thank you very much for your answer. thank you very much i'm going to mute myself if i don't please mute me because i'm just entering another meeting thank you so much Great. i'll thank be you. around thank i won't you. log off lovely yeah. thank you very thank much. you thank you so go ahead Gaurav and um, let's hear you. Uh, thanks. Uh, hello everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Gaurav Nalkur. I uh, am an ecotourism enthusiast uh, preparing to be a specialist in the matter. I am very passionate about sustainable tourism, especially uh, tourism that involves local communities to a great extent. Uh, so today we're going to talk, uh, I'm just presenting a little bit on Indian pangolins specifically. Uh, I'd like to request, uh, can my, my colleague Priya Sudan, can she please uh, share the presentation? Thanks Priya. Uh, so basically I'm just going to talk about the status of the Indian pangolin. Uh, before that, a brief introduction. So just a little visual uh, from IUCN. Uh, I will be talking about these points later, so uh, if you haven't read them, not a problem. Uh, so the Indian pangolin is one of two species found in India. Uh, it's found throughout most of the Indian subcontinent, except for uh, the northernmost reaches of Kashmir and northeast India, where the Chinese pangolin replaces it. So in the map that you can see, the brownish green is uh, the Indian pangolin's home range. And the blue represents the Chinese pangolin in India. So, uh, like I said, it is one of two pangolin species found here. Uh, the other is the Chinese pangolin. Uh, it's fairly widespread through India and found in uh, scrub areas, cultivation, uh, forests, and semi-arid areas. So this is why the habitat around Gir is perfect. Uh, it's a dry forest plus the de deciduous leaf cover uh, gives uh, provides a home to a lot of ground insects like ants and termites, which the pangolin feeds on. Uh, the population is actually relatively unknown. Uh, there are, apart from a few uh, good estimates, there are no proper numbers. And this is because there's no systematic studies uh, that have been conducted to gauge population. So it tells you how enigmatic an animal this is. So unless dense sites are known, spotting a pangolin is usually a matter of chance. So you can't really go looking for a pangolin unless you know uh, where its dense sites are. So they can vary in length uh, from about 80 to 120 centimeters. They can weigh anything from 8 to 17 kg. So not a very big animal. Uh, as you've seen already in uh, Chavez's uh, photos, uh, they reach sexual maturity at the age of two and they usually give birth to a single young. So this again is another uh, problem that pangolins face because they reproduce so slowly. Um, basically, when their numbers are wiped out, it'll, it can take time for their populations to uh, bounce back. So they live mostly on a diet of ants and termites, but they also eat other invertebrates as well. And uh, this great appetite of theirs for insects gives them their most important role in their ecosystem, uh, pest control. So in fact, it's estimated that an adult pangolin can consume more than 70 million insects annually. So that is just the impact that one pangolin has on the insect population. Another ecological importance is uh, their burrowing actually aerates the soil, something like what farmers would do when they plow and uh, toss the soil. just a photo of uh, a pangolin just to give you a brief idea of what it looks like i mean already chavez has shared his photos and you've seen a few others so they uh, provide an all-natural pest control 
they also aerate the soil uh, similar to what uh, earthworms do or if you want to look at the human aspect what uh, farmers do when they plow crop fields so this in, uh, improves the nutrient quality of uh, forest soil it also provides a good substrate for um, a new growth of uh, plants and aband when abandoned their underground burrows also provide habitats for other animals uh, in especially snakes Uh, it's classified as endangered by the IUCN and uh, it's listed as a schedule one species in the wild in India's Wildlife Protection Act. So this actually uh, gives them the highest level of protection similar to uh, big cats and the elephant. Uh, it's also been placed on appendix one of the uh, CITES that's the Convention of International Trade in Endangered Species. So uh, appendix one basically means that uh, this animal is in danger of extinction. And of course, it prohibits all trade except for any scientific or educational purposes. But uh, the problem is, despite this uh, protection that they have on paper, they're still rampantly hunted in India. Usually they are smuggled across the borders for the use in the East Asian traditional medicine market. Uh, another problem, like Chavez uh, said, is education. So while most people are well aware of endangered species like big cats, elephants, or rhinos, many people don't even know that pangolins exist. Uh, both species of pangolins in India are uh, hunted for meat and as well as the usage of scales for traditional medicine. And uh, they may be the most trafficked endangered animal in the world, actually. Uh, in India, some tribes hunt pangolins traditionally. Uh, this is not the case in Gir, but uh, there is uh, the killing in Gir is mostly done accidental or they are thought of as ill omens. Uh, they are traditionally hunted for meat in uh, some parts of uh, Northeast India, uh, but most poaching has been uh, takes place to provide pangolin scales for the uh, traditional medicine market. Uh, most hunters when interviewed have described hunting pangolins as being dependent on finding field signs. So that is pug marks or fresh den holes. Uh, they usually hunted in the summer and uh, a single hunter can probably uh, fetch about 9,000 rupees uh, for one pangolin. Uh, so that's equivalent to about four months worth of the local average income uh, for that. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> is there a problem with my sound? No, you 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 audible. I think um, uh, Shamji, uh, can you just check your sound system? Is can everybody hear? Gaurav, can you just write yes if you can? Karin, can you hear? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I'll, I'll continue. Okay. Then. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so catching pangolins is actually a very gruesome technique. Uh, they, uh, to extract the scales, a uh, whole, you, you cannot shoot or, you know, hunt a pangolin in the traditional way. So it actually involves catching them and using, uh, really cruel methods like boiling them alive or, uh, you know, roasting them alive. So that their scales can be extracted and they usually uh, smuggled to East Asian markets. And most of the trafficking evidence uh, seems to come from Manipur, Tamil Nadu, Karnatak and Madhya Pradesh. So despite no proven medical benefits, this high demand from the East Asian market uh, drives this poaching, uh, drives most of this poaching. So just a brief uh, summary of uh, what I said, the scales are made of keratin, uh, similar to what we have on our nails or our hair, uh, similar to rhino horn, actually. And uh, it's actually very easy to catch because it rolls into a ball uh, when it's threatened. This, I think this behavior is called volvation. And uh, once it rolls into a ball, it's actually very easy just to pick up and, you know, uh, catch.
So up to 20 tons of pangolin and their uh, body parts are trafficked internationally every year. Uh, in East Asia, their meat is considered a uh, delicacy or even uh, they say it has medicinal benefits, although uh, there is no proof of this. So sorry for the really gruesome images, but uh, like I said, hunting pangolins is a very cruel act indeed. So luckily, uh, there is quite a lot of work being you, done on the ground. Uh, Sorry, Gaurav, can you go back to the previous slide and just, you know, just explain the route once? So that okay. Uh, so basically, most of uh, <clears throat> most of uh, the pangolin hunting hap uh, or at least the trafficking happens on the eastern side of India. Uh, Madhya Pradesh, Karnataka, and Tamil Nadu are not shown in the maps, uh, but uh, they are the centers from where these places. Uh, where these uh, pangolins are hunted and uh, they are trafficked through uh, ports like Kolkata or uh, they are trafficked through Manipur and Assam uh, into China uh, through Nepal and Tibet. Uh, luckily, there is uh, quite a lot of work being done on the ground by forest officials. Uh, you know, but this always happens whenever cases of trade or poaching are reported. It is not a very uh, active thing, unfortunately. But yes, great work is being done. So I think uh, there's a brief section on what you can do to help save pangolins, but I think uh, Mohit can explain this better. So uh, I think I'll halt my presentation there. That was really, really wonderful. Um, thank you, Gaurav. Thank you. Um, you worked hard on this, this aspect. It's important for people to know. We don't have to go too much into the science of it as long as people know that it's, um, it's endangered and we really need to start focusing on it. And we need to spread the word around uh, with, with different you know, societies, different kind of people, so that the cause is um, like tiger or elephant or like any big mammal, um, the cause of, of pangolin should also be addressed at the same level. So yeah. over to you, Hasi Bhai, for, for more information. Thank you very much, Mohit Bhai. So I'm Hasib Sheikh. I'm from Ahmedabad, Gujarat. And uh, other than Jambu Goda, which was my first school of... Uh, education or learning or absorbing the wild and the wilderness and the art of it and the beauty of it here has been the second place because my grand uncle was the principal chief conservator of forest gujarat state and he was based at Gir for most of his life most of the points that i could have covered in this have already been covered by chavez and uh, uh, of course by goro so i'm going to put more stress on things that probably i think that uh, that were not covered in a way so that so as to make this webinar more interesting so the scientific name you have understood and it's called the thick tail pangolin or the scaly anteater as in common english in india but in gujarati at Gir, it has a very interesting name and that's called kili cow one that eats ants so it's called the kiri cow. Can you spell? Can you spell it out? I'll put it in the chat for everyone. Kiri cow. Kiri as in the ant. K i d i. Cow as in the eater. So okay. ant eater. So k h u u cow is as in data. Physical features. Gaurav has thrown some light on it about the Indian pangolin, but uh, it's uh, on an average it's about ten to sixteen kgs. Uh, female are smaller than males and the length could be at times up to four feet long and uh, the scales are rusty and they're very big and they act like an armor and there's it's so firm and so adherent that if you try to pierce the skin the poachers they try to pierce the skin with kind of very spiky things like knives or spears it just doesn't go in you know it's it's such a uh, 
I once got to saw this uh, pride of, it was a small pride of lions and gear, which was playing with something, which I thought that probably, how could a passerby in a safari throw a ball around? And finally, I gathered that it was a pangolin. And the pangolin finally managed to get out. So it rolled, as the Gaurav already told, that it's called the valuation. And it had rolled itself to save. And, and somehow this pride, the, especially the juveniles and the sub were playing with it like a ball, uh, like a domestic uh, or a pet dog at home picks up a ball. And they couldn't just pierce the armor. It's such a good one. It's made of keratin. Gaurav told they did that. Uh, one point that you all should know that the, uh, the scales roughly weigh about one third of the total body weight of uh, the pangolin itself. And that one third is a huge thing to have, you know, it's like our skin weighing one third of our body. It's exactly the same way. Uh, the three visible digits on its four limbs, which are like hands, uh, have long claws and they are just three in number or they have, they, they have more digits uh, on the four limb but the three claws that come out makes you uh, feel that they are only three because those claws are long and they give you uh, they are something like the claws of the sloth bear or the sloth itself as in the southern american animal mammal so uh, the indian pangolin especially the ones that give seldom climb trees but you will see them climbing uh fallen off uh, and you know uh, fallen off dead trees that are just lying around so they are very agile climbers they swim well they're very good swimmers of course and very slow walk walkers but when you see them it's fun to see them walking around they like to walk through barren or you know uh, dry farmlands or dry paths in the jungle where, uh, you know, there is a bed of grass around or a bed of uh, dry leaves around. And it's like uh, a toy which has been winded up in a, by the key. And it's biped when it's, you know, in a great uh, speed. So it walks like a toy. It's like you have winded up a uh, toy through a key and then you let it go through uh, free. And that's exactly the way. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing to watch this uh, pangolins go by. Very alert. They are very, very alert. Yeah. Asif, if I pause you for, for two minutes, I have a video that I can show them what, what it is like. Exactly. That would be great. That would be great. That would be great. That would be great. अरे आम तर तू तू आम त्याम बजर आम त्याम को ताकाय ना तो सागर बन को काये कहाँ हों तो दी तू रे उन्हें भी धन कहाँ थी तभी छोटी है आई तू अटली दीवाल में छोटी क्यों ना दीवाल में क्या छोटा अटली सागर था दैट्स दैट्स द साउरास्चन लेजा एमपीजी एमपीजी वन हाँ एमपीजी वन एम आई एम Am I coming in? You go ahead, uh, see by because the video is, is yeah. Uh, am I am I coming in? Is, am I audible to all? Yes, you are. Go, so that was ahead. at gear. The clip that show was shown by Mohit Bai was at gear because there was a Sarvashin Gujarati ascent to what they were talking around. Now another point that has to be elaborated because most of the points have been covered is why the it's not being pushed much in uh, gear, but. It is losing in numbers only because of the road kills and people have no knowledge about this particular mammal that has been around. That's the only reason. They think it's like something unknown thing which seems to be dangerous 
at times i've heard people uh, you know crying out that it's a crocodile baby at times the people think that is kind of a honey badger that has come around and it has a very bad reputation of having a ghost uh, incarnation or in a way uh, that way so it's been killed and it's mercilessly killed uh, gaurav already showed you how mercilessly it is being killed but there's one another method that is that was used in gujarat especially and that was like the with sheer manpower of four or five people hanging around and they used to unroll or unroll the poor uh, pangolin and then slit or spear open the throat and then kill it and then get the meat out get rid of the meat and get the scales and the claws and the eyes and somehow uh, you know smuggle them into madhya pradesh through baroda that is the ali rajpur road that was the most famous thing with pangolins and all so and from madhya pradesh onwards it would have its eastward journey towards orissa and then it would go into the northeast and then that's when it crosses the border into china but remember uh contrary to the popular belief there are more people eating mammal animals insects or endangered species body parts in the united states canada and mexico than in china you have to remember that statistic china does it but then there are more people who fall into this kind of uh lies or myths and then consume it so the market out there is up to uh not pangolin of course is nocturnal throughout the subcontinent uh, it is found it's found in pakistan of course it is found in bangladesh and in india it's found in the length and the breadth of country except the northernmost part in kashmir and uh, around four out of the seven states which are of the northeast which are touching burma and china it's not found there so it's found up to arunachal and assam not beyond it so that's where it is found uh why it is not being posted in gujarat for monetary reasons is because gujarat is pretty far away from the eastern border uh, where it is smuggled into that is from china it's further furthest away from china the only uh, country that has a border with gujarat is pakistan and that itself is a very rough terrain and highly guarded border so it doesn't go through uh, into pakistan even if the approachers would want it uh, to have a route through pakistan uh, most of the dwellers or the uh, uh, in gir the human dwellers of gir are vegetarian uh, and therefore the pangolin do not have any fear of meat eating or bush meat eating thing that could have happened right there so uh fairly available uh one out of 10 safaris at uh, gir does see a pangolin it's a different story that uh, many times people do not recognize it sometimes the drivers and the guides also fail to recognize it but yes it's uh, uh, not too common but yes it's fairly common when compared to other parts of india uh, the sighting of pangolin at uh, gir the beautiful flux like uh, funnel like uh, snout and uh, head it has the tongue is very sticky and slimy and it's about uh, almost uh, half its body length and it can come out uh, a long way about 2 to 3 feet 2 to 2 and a half feet to be precise and then it goes and looks for the crevices uh, in and around the place or into the <coughs> you know the fallen off wood uh, which is deteriorated and then it uh, puts it uh, uh, you know tongue through the crevices and into the places uh, like a surgeon puts the camera through the wire into a human body during a surgery and then all these ants and termites they stick to the tongue <coughs> and in one gulp everything goes in then it again goes back searching inside it uh, breaks up the rotten wood and everything to, with its four claws uh, in the four limbs and uh, uh, it lives in the burrows and most of the time it tries to find the burrows right under the trees because uh, there the roots are deep inside and where there are roots there'll be water uh, and there'll also be a lot of insects so it's a perfect place right under some tree uh, 
and it's a very docile very docile and mammal uh, harmless very harmless it's just that the people get scared of it and they just try uh, and they just kill it because in self defense which is not needed uncalled for it's a very harmless thing very alert when it sees moments it would just go walk past but then at the same time it is like a honey badger a bit of fearlessness you can see it in it uh when when somebody approaches it it takes its own time to turn back and walk away it doesn't panic a lot and that's more of a reason that when people get to it while running uh you know it rolls itself and humans can pick it up very easily i suppose i've added to whatever Sh shavishima and uh, uh goro have told you and the information that they have given you uh it's very easy or one out of 10 chances i would say if you are towards the bamba four gate of gear and that's exactly where mohit's by mohit by's gear birding lodge lies uh, one of my first, uh, you know, sightings uh, 20 years back was through that gate. Uh, at that time, that gate wasn't used a lot, uh, but we went through inside and it was very close to uh, the deer birding lodge property of Asian Adventures that I first got to see the pangolin in my life. Uh, after that, quite a few times when I take my clients and my guests who are inbound and they just go around, most of the time on the exit through the Bamba Four Gate, right next to the Gear Budding Lodge is when I have seen that beautiful mammal. So you're all welcome to Gear. You're all welcome to, uh, uh, you know, the Gear Budding Lodge. What better place? And Gear Budding Lodge itself is in 22 acres. And uh, I'm sure the pangolins come in, although I've never seen it in Gear Budding Lodge, but they must be coming in, I'm sure all up to you know uh, you, when you come around there you're most welcome around those places and you love the pangolins it's not just lions or tigers in india there are a lot more can to you it. add can you add a little perspective to the the you know how um, what used to happen in the ancient times to pangolin uh the yeah. in ancient times they were you know were considered to be a bad omen Goro already threw some light on it i mean a statement on it uh, they were considered to be a bad omen only because the way they walk it was considered that uh, the ones walking on four limbs uh, are animals but there are certain animals who are taken over by the spirits and they start walking on two limbs and bengali more so when it picks up the momentum okay. it walks on two limbs so that's the reason why they were killed and then they thought that this other two limbs would be used uh, by this dreadful animals to pick up small new uh, infants or newborn babies and this animal which is possessed by spirit will take away their babies and they would just kill them and that's the reason in the 18th and the 19th century a lot of uh, pangolins were killed not because of bushmeat not because to smuggle their scales or their uh, you know uh, claws but only out of fear out of myths and superstitions that in gujarat that they were killed uh, road kills are a major contributor to the lessening population of uh, pangolins though <coughs> they are very much uh, but uh, the scales are used for variety of reasons of course they are used for aphrodisiacs uh, in china uh, but then in india the scales are mostly used to make decorative things you know they are they are used to make decorative armors and uh, in olden times there was a king from the gujarat area who had an armor that had scales on uh, the pangolin scales on his armor so if you surf to the net you will get the picture of that armor too yeah mohit bhai okay great so um Great. This is this is very very uh, very informative, Hasib Bai. And uh, may I end up uh, your slideshow now here? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Good. Good. Excellent. I, I'm, I'm open for questions and answers. Uh, question answer session. Sure. We will we'll take them right in the end. Yeah. What I'm going to do is uh, quickly tell people 
I need information from people actually. I need to know what I should do to save pangolins and geese. So I prepared a little slide presentation of, of what um, Gaurav and uh, our ecotourism team and our gear burning lodge team, you know, they proposed to do. So I'm going to quickly show what we have in mind and then we will take questions and answers. And also I'd like people to put in the chat box, whatever they think that we should be doing there, uh, you know, as GBL or gear burning lodge team to help pangolin. A quick uh, um, <clears throat> uh, slideshow to tell you that uh, we want to take this cause up. We want to uh, talk about pangolin to different kinds of people and whether they're resort owners or they are hoteliers or their local communities, school children, uh, tourists who come there uh, to see lions and we want to educate them. So when they go home, they can talk about Pangolin and then take the cause forward. So, um, you know, for example, this is all happening in, in different parts of Maharashtra. Um, the, the photos that I'm showing, I don't have any photos from Gujarat because um, Gir is uh, largely lion centric and, and a lot of work has been done. But I'll tell you, there is a fantastic rescue center in Gir, which is protecting every kind of animal you know, any injured kind of animal, any uh, rescue, um, any animal to be rescued from the villages or anywhere else. And then they treat it and they release it back into the wild. So these are some of the slides that I'm showing you from different parts of India, where NGOs and schools and, and other people are doing uh, things to protect um, pangolins. So through this webinar, we need to address, uh, we need to talk to local communities. I personally, my team is not involved with any of this yet. And this is something that we want to start from 1st of April to educate ourselves what local people know about pangolin, what their emotions are, how will they treat pangolin if they see one and work with them to raise awareness with uh, with the new generation. So that's, uh, but if you've got more ideas, feel free to put in so that I can, I can weave that into our plan, you know? Yes, go, go right ahead, I see, bye, tell me. You're, you're, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, am I coming in now? Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, so there's one point that probably Chavez and uh, Gaurav uh, missed out. And just for the benefit of our attendees right here, I'll tell you. Pangolins do not have teeth. They just do not have teeth. Yes. They just gulp yes. and swallow all the termites, all the ants, and some small time insects like uh, they could be, you know, mantises and other things, uh, you know. And they have a very, very strong digestive system, very strong yeah. digestive system. So, and that's how the diet goes in. So this absolutely. was for the benefit of our uh, uh, attendees. So it's believed that they consume seven crore insects a year. So if these insects start to feed on our crops, we'll have very little food to eat. Exactly. Again, I think this, this particular photo is from Pakistan where somebody's kept it as a pet and again from Pakistan. But I remember I come from Amritsar and I remember that there were instances when we used to see pangolins as kids outside Amritsar in those fields and I'm sure they're still there. So uh, somewhere in Maharashtra or somewhere they are celebrating something to do with pangolins. So we want to talk to farmers to educate ourselves more, maybe create some sort of collateral information sheets for farmers in the local language, gain more knowledge from them, also create videos in Gujarati, urging them to leave space for wildlife. In, uh, I know it's subsistence farming, it's very difficult because they want to, they want to use every inch of land to increase the production of the crop. In Brazil, they, uh, I've been told that each farmer or any project has to leave 20% of their land uh, as corridors for wildlife. 
wildlife movement. So 20% is, is, is a lot of um, land to leave. So for example, if you've got 22 acres, you know, that would mean setting aside four acres for wildlife movement. And, and that's pretty good. And be tolerant of wildlife in your area. Pangolin uh, is the key species because it's highly endangered. But it goes without saying that we'll be protecting every every life form, every species on this planet, on in this gear landscape that we're talking about. So farmers, with farmers, it's it's very essential because what is happening is the land holdings are becoming smaller. People are looking at fast growing crops such as mangoes and they're building walls. You know, uh, if you're talking about 675 lions in this gear landscape, this 675 lions move right up to Bhavnagar and beyond. But now because there are so many areas with barbed wires, with walls, some lions can jump across, but not cubs, not smaller ones. So lions are facing this problem as well. And so will these problems, uh, uh, porcupines and, and uh, pangolin will also face these problems. So my point is that, are we going to create some sort of gaps in these walls? Are we going to create some sort of holes for these, um, for these animals to cross over into another piece of land? I don't know. I'm going to try this out. And no um, tourism outfit is currently doing this very actively. And everybody will be willing to do it if we start talking. So that's where we want to we want to put a GBL team to this use, and they're very very keen. They are they are super keen to take this ahead. So limit the use of chemical fertilizers and go green. Urge them to check the wells. You saw one photo of a pangolin fallen into a well, which was again it was rescued by the forest department, taken to the rescue center, and later released back into the wild. So that's what we want to do with farmers. And then real estate developers. So, so as you know that most of these places are uh, becoming very sort of um, real estate um, oriented. People see forest land or these farmlands as great um, opportunities for tourism. So they want to build hotels or they want to build these colonies where people can go and buy houses and they want to give a whole lot of frills um, uh, like swimming pools and other things. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not talking about all of that right now because I'm not against that really as long as it's done sustainably, but we need to talk to them. So, so this is going to be one big fight, for example, Right now, we're talking to, to certain kind of people, architects, that why don't they start building nests in the walls of the buildings which they construct or start putting swift nets in the, in the roofs of the building which they construct. Similarly, we want to talk to the real estate developers in and around gear to allow space for wildlife and especially pangolins. Pangolin is, is, is going to spearhead the cause of other species. Um, so, so Dr. Shastri, I'm 100% I'm sure that this is not going to be an easy task and we are not going to, um, we're not going to find it very easy, but we have to start somewhere. So I don't know how much I can achieve in my lifetime, but that's not important. The important part is to get started. Um, so then, we talking about so, so just to give you some ideas of uh, green corridors, um, you know what people are doing across the world, and then create convert tourists into eco tourists. You know, every every tourist wants to come and see a lion. Everybody wants to go into the park, and why not? You know, that's how they get sensitized. That's how the children will get sensitized because they would see a big cat and uh, with lots of cups and there'll be certain kind of emotion that will erupt and that will help them you know uh, 
appreciate why. But at the same time, if they know a wee bit more, let's say about Pangolin, then it will be a jaw-dropping experience. Because then they will say, oh, wow, there's a thing like that as well. We never knew about it. It may not be as interesting looking as lion is or a leopard, but something like that even exists on the planet. A huge number of tourists who are coming into Gay are coming because they want to see a lion. And uh, they, they, they have no clue what this, what this animal is all about. So we want to, uh, excuse me, sorry. So we want to curate gift items with strong messages, urge travelers to create videos, post, uh, uh, you know, spread awareness through social media, create events to attract attention. We will create a lot of events and posters, videos, information sheets, all of, all of that. You know, that's how we, we happy Pangolin Day. All this you will see happening in the next uh, few months or a year or a year and a half. We're still planning and this, this will be work in progress. Then we want to talk to journalists. We want to talk about, you know, carrying this cause forward through newspapers, publications, encourage social media influencers to talk about it. We want to get hoteliers, homestay owners and talk to their staff about it, you know. So posters, plaques, handouts. Priya, do we have a handout here for people to take? Yeah, I think there is. I'm going to share it quickly with you. We made something, my office made something that you can take with you, download this file and print out and put it put wherever you want. If you've got a shop, you've got a studio, you've got home, society, anywhere. Just put it up so that people know what a pangolin is, you know, um, uh, sort of a thing. So, you know, put them into various publications. It shouldn't be just on internet because the internet is good for those people who are finding things on the internet. They know what to find. It's not appearing on its own. So Sentil is here today. Sentil is uh, a friend from um, from South India, and he just sent me a WhatsApp message with a dead pangolin which he found in Iriki. I'm, I I just brought out um, these pictures to show you what what kind of work is going on around in the country. And then talk to uh, the youth for educational campaigns, schools, college students, get forest departments, um, you know, no objection certificate to go ahead with all this, uh, get pharmaceutical industries and other industries interested in the cause of pangolin to support events. So the, the plans are huge, but it's uh, one step at a time, like how Lao Tzu said, you know, take one step at a time if you want to walk about 1,000 miles. And um, some more of this, this is so heartening to see that the kind of work which is being done is amazing, absolutely wonderful. So go ahead, Asi, bye, and ask your question. I'm sorry I was holding you back for a long time. No, yeah. no, I could understand that. But here, uh, on the, on the uh, you know, the chat, uh, in the chat box, some wonderful uh, attendees have given some uh, amazing suggestions. So I got an idea right there that uh, the first thing I do when we are there for our uh, project of Bengalis right there, which is our next project at Gilbert Lodges, for our cafeteria area, I put the pangolin charcoal on paper, some of the pangolin habits, and then we frame it up and we give it up. So my charcoal on paper draw a sketch of pangolins is coming there. Also, we have already discussed about, uh, you know, all the visitors with the workshops that we are going to do up there. Uh, so let's begin our first workshop by sketching pangolins for the kids. Yes. Uh, Hasib Bhai has very kindly agreed to hold a workshop for people who want to come and learn more about the natural history uh, of, of, Gil, uh, of Gil National Park. And the dates will be set soon, which we'll send out to you. You can come and join his workshop. And then, you know, he's, he's a great one to take you uh, with a flashlight to show you owls and, you know, uh, walk through 
the, the farmland and the jungle and you'd be able to do safaris and a whole lot of that um, that you'd be able to see so so friends um, i i want to ask you if you've got any questions that you want to put here let me just quickly go through um, uh, and i'm really really happy uh, for your appreciation mr uh, mohit yes yes mm, uh, may i i have a few questions not not questions i have a few things i would like to share if that is okay yes please please do shavez please go right yeah. ahead <laughs> okay let me, uh, okay i'll just uh, i'll just unmute myself so a few things i want to say first of all i i read your i heard your presentation with great interest i have a few things i want to share i'll try to make them very quick first of all they're not in any order so uh, first one of the topics you were talking about fertilizers you also have to understand uh, you see when you put fertilizers in plantations animals like you see elephants for example right they are eating the grass over there so if the so if the grass is full of fertilizers elephants actually have lot of pesticides in their body system which is affecting their liver and so on so and sometimes you see owls which are dead or leopard cats which are dead in plantations because of these fertilizers being used a lot of pangolins have been dying in plantations as well because of pesticide and fertilizers as well so it would be great if you can monitor these activities in controlled areas i mean i'm just sharing a thought number 1 uh, number 2 you have to understand i'm sure you know the cpec which is the chinese highway which project which you want to do through pakistan central asia europe you have to understand this is a fantastic economic project perhaps but this is also a disastrous project for animal trade because pangolin population is going down downhill because of uh, this project because it's very easy now you can just drive up to china and trade the indian pangolin <clears throat> uh next uh, two points which i'll try to combine is the power of social media now everybody is on social media tiktok instagram if we can do more campaigns on this get some celebrities you know <clears throat> this will make a big difference uh we do a very active pangolin conservation education program which i can share with you privately later whoever is interested we're having a pangolin day <clears throat> next week as well uh, two weeks from now so i'm happy to share that as well and how we are organizing that and how you all can do it but the most important thing which i want to share you talk talk about talk about tourism right yes people want to come to india to see tigers lions snow leopards who want, but do they want to see pangolins I tell you, there are a lot of people, internationally at least, who would love to see a pangolin, and locally as well. Question is, how do you find a pangolin? In Borneo, it's almost impossible, and everywhere else. So I have a suggestion, a solution, a bit controversial, but perhaps it might just work out in India. You see, I wanted to do pangolin tracking in Borneo. You, if you can do. elephant collaring and track them for enforcement and research and tourism purposes why not do pangolins as well the problem is in borneo the, the tropical forest the canopy is too thick so you cannot put a, a, a gps chip on a satellite chip on a pangolin and then follow it unless you have full time staff because you have to be really close to the pangolin it's logistically a nightmare and very expensive however in south africa for example the canopy is not very thick and i have a friend there dr wendy and and a few other people who track pangolins and is very easy easier because you can track a pangolin from a kilometer away because you can pick it pick up the signal and then they also show pangolins to their in house guests so i thought why not we try this experiment on the indian pangolin so i got some funding from from the uk and we have partnered with a university in rawalpindi in pakistan with dr tarik and we're going to try this experiment on pangolins in pakistan on the indian pangolin it's going to be a tourism program we're going to put this we have already bought three transmitters and we're going to put it on the indian pangolin and see if we can successfully track it every night if we can we could do controlled responsible wildlife tourism if if this is successful can you imagine if this can be happening in gir or india and other parts of india i mean you, for example your lodge yourself mr mohit if you could put a, a, a locate once the tourism recovers allocate a small budget for uh transmitters and so on and get the local farmers to get participate in this program because right now the farmers think a pangolin they see it or oh, they're like oh uh 10000 rupees right maybe they would be getting 2000 or 3000 rupees a day if they were just tracking the pangolin well, i don't know the currency value in india at the moment sorry sorry for my ignorance but my point is let, let's say 100 if they sold the pangolin it might be 100 bucks okay but let's say they track the pangolin the farmer the poor 
farmer in gir or a poor farmer in in india i'm not looking down on anybody i'm just saying these these guys are looking for a monetary value can you imagine if you can hire them to track a pangolin they get money more jobs are created as cooks and guides and so on and you get to save pangolins yes some scientists might argue it affects them it stresses them blah 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 but oh, that, that that's a different topic my point is this is a experiment perhaps you could try it could revolutionize pangolin tourism conservation uh, this is just a suggestion and a thought i just wanted to share that thank you thank you thank you very much um thank you shavez there are there are many challenges uh, related to this topic and i will share with uh, them in person with you to to tell you um it may not be that feasible here um but uh, there are lots of animals which are being tracked um Uh, by uh, the wildlife department and by the researchers here and uh, tourism you know <laughs> to like everybody knows tourism is a double edged sword so um, so indian scientists are very cautious they don't want to open the flood gates you know so like you said it's, it has to be controlled so it's a it's a very debatable issue currently in india and we we will take it further but right now we've got so much on a play try not to handle in terms of eco tourism the entire concept of eco tourism hasn't been understood by the indian tourism committee uh, uh, um, community fraternity so they need to understand that first which is why gorav is is um, is becoming an expert on eco tourism so that he can start to talk to people what it entails it's not just about the you know one time plastic or any small thing like straw or anything it's a much much larger game than that so so thank you for bringing that further and we will be considering it uh, as we go along and right now i will need your help in every way possible we're going to uh, you know put all the information on cloud for people to make use of and i would be able to put the information that you share in cloud as well so that people have um, access to that so whoever wants to do anything with pangolin conservation can just come up and we we will devise a simple solution and we say just go ahead and do this you know let's see what happens let's see what result we get out of it and if every everyone who's here today on this webinar starts to do small bits just be bits then there will be a huge furor and there will and pangolin will be um center of attraction for the wildlife community and nature lovers very well said mr mohay thank you for that yeah i agree with you thank you yeah great friend so um i um, you know uh, usually it's last for an hour it's an hour and 10 um i'd like to say uh, goodbye to everyone and thank you for being here friends there are some links that have been shared we've shared a file as well um we're going to bring another webinar very soon to you that will uh, be related to developing wildlife habitats in and around the places you live so uh, so there's a gentleman uh, uh, mohammed dilawar he's from bombay and i just have to set the date and let you know um, for this webinar when that's going to be it's going to be the most interesting one but it'll be about 3 weeks from now in the meantime we'll we'll send you an update what we're doing with um pangolin conservation in kit uh, just a small correction mohammed dilawar from nashik oh from nashik i'm sorry about that yes thank you friends thank you namaste thank you gaurav thank you see bye thank you thank you all thanks for inviting me to speak thank you bye bye